Our Father in thank heaven, you. we thank thee for the blessings that we have. We're so grateful for, for the opportunity to study and learn about the history of the early days of the Restoration. We ask thy blessings to be on Mrs. Adams, and we ask thy blessings to be on the technology that it will work well, that we will be able to receive and hear and understand. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, we are beginning a second part of Kirtland and the making of a covenant people. So uh, last week we talked about the Lord giving the commandment in section 88 for the brethren to call a solemn assembly. They understood that this would be a temple meeting and in that that was in verse 70 of section 88 and in that same section toward the end of the section beginning at about verse 27 the Lord begins to talk to them about uh, the brethren participating in the ordinance of the washing of feet. And they began immediately, uh, right after this revelation was received on, the de on December 27th of 1832, um, uh, they went into an, an organization of some of this School of the Prophets business and participated in January and February, I guess, in the washing of feet. But we're going to go forward a little, and we're seeing a preparatory and training period uh, begin for the restoration of the partial endowment that is received in the Kirtland Temple. Last week, we made mention of the fact that part of the preparation for this was uh, concerning the Abrahamic papyrus that Joseph Smith came into possession of which was one of the points that we intended to cover and we didn't get there. So what we're going to do today is go there before we move on. So our lesson considerations last week were about the revelations that began to plant temple concepts in Joseph's mind, how the temple instructions began to unfold in, in Kirtland, and what part the Abrahamic papyrus, papyrus played in Kirtland Temple understanding. And that's where we are today for just a few minutes before we go into the rest of what we want to talk about today. Now, um, as we do this, I hope that you don't feel really rushed as we go through the mummies. When um, my husband and I taught uh, church history at um, Harvard and Boston College a few years ago in, in Massachusetts, we discovered that our uh, students had never heard of the mummies, so this was kind of a fun discussion with them. So to pick up where we left off, the brethren broke the ground on uh, June 5th of 1833, and two months later they laid the cornerstones after the order of the holy priesthood. Now all through this discussion the Lord keeps talking about the order of, the order of, the order of. Everything is done in a precise order and the brethren have to follow that order. That order is to teach them things. It's to teach them about the uh, organization of the Godhead. It's to teach them about the organization and the administration of the priesthood. And so they followed the order that the Lord gave them with the proper individuals laying the proper stone in the proper place and the next quorum uh, down, laying the next stone and so forth, and all of these things had to be in order. So we learned that the first presidency laid the stone on the southeast corner and the remaining three cornerstones were laid by other leaders. It was a big thing to lay a cornerstone. I didn't realize how big a thing this was until I was reviewing uh, The Mountain of the Lord's House, which is a film the church produced on the on the building of the Salt Lake Temple and watched them lower the cornerstone with the cranes into place. It was a big thing in Kirtland. Uh, so what we're looking at here is Mother Smith talking to us about the privations and the difficulties that it took to build this temple. Um, in, in 1833 to 1836, Everything in Kirtland centered around the construction of this temple. The, the hearts of the people were just thrown into this and they were completely involved. The women did everything that they could to help provide for the workmen. Uh, we know that they sewed on the veils of the temple, which are not the same thing as the veils in the temple today, but had a particular purpose. We know that uh, Heber C. Kimball said, my wife worked as hard as any man who worked on this temple, and so did these other women. 
according to the prophet's mother, the saints had to endure great fatigue and privation in consequence of the opposition they met with from their enemies, which was so great that they were compelled to keep a guard around the walls much of the time until they were completed. Uh, so we had men who slept in the temple and who kept uh, weapons with them to defend the temple in case uh, the mobs who had threatened were going to do something disastrous to it. So Mother Smith said they gave no sleep to their eyes nor slumber to their eyelids until they found a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. You can see there what this temple meant to her. There was but one mainspring to all our thoughts and action, actions, and that was the building of the Lord's house. Now this is a little picture of a stone quarry, where the brethren got the stone to build most of the stone for the temple. And when the construction began, Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, Brigham Young, Lorenzo D. Young, his brother, Reynolds Cahoon, rode south to the quarry. It was two miles from the site and uh, made sure that the stone was suitable for the temple walls, which would be two feet thick and more than 60 feet high. And they would load their wagons and other workmen would also take the stone back to the construction site. Now, Joseph was a, a foreman in the quarry. And he went to Quarrying Rock, just like the rest of us. We see here Elder Kimball telling us how this was done. And he would dress in his tow frock. This was a kind of a linen frock and breech, breeches and work in the, in the quarry, quarry, quarrying stone, just like the rest of us. And then on Saturday, we brought out every team to draw stone to the temple. And we continued doing that till the house was finished. So everyone who, who was available, who had a team, was enlisted to help in this process. And uh, Brother Kimball says, the people who didn't have teams went to work in the stone quarry and prepared the stones for drawing them to the house. And Joseph Smith was our foreman in the quarry. Now we come to the mummies. They've been working on this temple. They've been thinking about this temple from the time of New York. But when they came into Kirtland and in 1832, the brethren were told in uh, their meeting, which is something that amounted to the School of the Prophets, that they were to call us a solemn assembly and build this temple. They were dedicated to this, and they were thinking and thinking about the revelations that Joseph had been given and the things that uh, were scriptural about temple building and so forth. And here we get all of a sudden this wonderful gift from heaven. It does have a bearing on their understanding of temple ordinances. It came to have a greater bearing when they went into Nauvoo. In fact, in Nauvoo, it had a monumental bearing on the things that they learned and did there in establishing a full endowment. But in this case, we're just in a an infant stage. And in the infant stage, the Lord is just pouring so many things into the minds of these people and opening up their thought processes and changing them from a worldly people into a covenant or temple people. That's why we call this lesson the making of a covenant people. They're learning and doing and becoming an entirely different people in the process of what's happening here. And the mummies contribute to this. And so we... Uh, get from Joseph Smith's history and from other histories a little a little uh, historical background on what was happening there. Joseph Smith writes a great deal about this in his diary or his journal and and um, this is transferred into the history of the church where he tells us this same information that I am taking here from uh, Brother Peterson who is an expert on this story that Antonio Labolo went into the catacombs of Egypt in uh, the place where the city of Thebes once stood. This is Luxor now. And he took 11, 11 mummies from these catacombs. Now you can see this charming photograph of the mummies up here. I, I'm supposing that some of you are wondering if that really is accurate, and I just have to say no, it isn't, but it's for our pleasure. The mummies came into the hands of Michael Chandler, at Labolo's death, he was supposedly, or he, uh, apparently, was the nephew of Antonio Labolo, who was a man of considerable uh, import in the in the world of antiquities and anthropology. These mummies came into his hands, and he started exhibiting them through the United States 
eastern United States from 1833 to 1835. And almost as soon as he got those off the boat, um, he knew there were inscriptions and writings that he wanted translated, and people, someone recommended to him immediately um, Joseph Smith as a translator. Other people did uh, mention this to him also, but they did it um, sarcastically. Everywhere he exhibited these mummies, they were received with acclaim. And uh, people saw the rolls of papyrus, the hieroglyphics, the wrappers, and the other appliances. They were all exceedingly interesting. And so the papers uh, sent out their reporters, and every uh, illustrious man of science went to examine the mummies, and everyone agreed that they were of considerable antiquity, and it was a marvelous thing. So we see... Uh, their response to this is very positive and excited, and it was a big uh, occasion to have the mummies come to your town where you could go and see something from the past of this nature. So people would even imagine how this could be. Maybe these were uh, persons who flourished when Moses and Aaron were little boys and deserved public attention. It's an interesting thought in the Saturday Evening Post of 1833. Um, we have testimony after testimony of persons who said, yes, these were, were actually um, authentic antiquities from the past. So we, now we come along to Mr. Charles Anthon. Because at a certain point, um, Mr. Chandler goes to Mr. Anthon and takes the papyrus skulls, scrolls and the parchment fragments that came with the mummies and asks Mr. Anthon if he could translate the material. Now the Rosetta Stone at this point had not uh, been interpreted and people had uh, very little understanding in terms of what we know today. It was almost minuscule of these ancient languages, but Mr. Anthon gave him a certificate of translation and um, Chandler then came to see Joseph Smith. And this is the home in which Joseph Smith lived when Mr. Chandler arrived. Mr. Chandler stayed in a hotel in Kirtland called the Riggs Hotel. And while he was in this hotel, he sent a notice to Joseph that he wanted him to come and look at these mummies to see if he, and see if he could work on the translation. And Joseph wrote him a letter, sent him a letter and said, I, I'm not able to come tonight. Uh, I have a prior engagement, but in the morning I will a look at them, and he or I will come and call on you. And um, Mr. Chandler sent him some of the papyrus and left it with the Prophet Joseph Smith overnight. And he, Joseph went over it as soon as he was able, and um, then gave to Mr. Chandler his translation. So Chandler says here, Ch uh, um, Brother Peterson says here, Mr. Chandler then showed the Prophet Joseph. Charles Anthon's translation, and stated that the translations of the prophet and the professor agreed to a point, but that there was one language that Professor Anthon could not translate that the prophet did, which is very interesting in light of all of the flap over uh, Professor Anthon wanting to translate the Book of Mormon, but he wasn't able to because it was a sealed book. Um, Michael Chandler gave Joseph, Joseph says he responded like a gentleman and gave me this certificate saying that anyone who wanted to know Mr. Joseph Smith Jr. in deciphering the ancient hieroglyphic characters, or the Egyptian characters, uh, which I have in many eminent cities showed to the most learned and from the information that I could ever learn or meet with, I find that of Mr. Joseph Smith, Jr. to correspond in the most minute manners. So, uh, matters. So the prophet uh, made note of that in his journal and, and kept a record of this incident. Well, uh, Joseph Smith was interesting, interested in purchasing the papyrus. And uh, Chandler told the prophet that he had sold all the mummies but four, and he wasn't going to sell these writings unless he could sell the last of the mummies with them. Now, we learn that Joseph Smith paid $2,400 for the mummies and the papyrus, which today would equate to about thirty-five dollars or $40,000. But 
Joseph didn't pay for all of this. The saints raised what they could, but there were other gentlemen in the area who were not members of the church who were very interested in these writings, and they contributed a considerable amount of this money and donated the mummies and the papyrus to the prophet Joseph Smith. And Joseph made these available for their inspection whenever they wanted, and people came continually from this point until they left Kirtland to see these mummies, and Joseph would often uh, show them, and, it, and he says in his journal repeatedly, I showed the mummies, I showed the papyrus to this group or to that group, and I explained to them the, the ancient writings and some of the customs and manners of the ancient people. So he tells us that on the 6th of June, 1835, he started uh, translating some of the characters on the, on the mummies. Um, I'm finding that date a little bit interesting because I had in my mind that the mummies didn't arrive there until July. So I, I wonder if I should check this to be precise, but nevertheless, he tells us, I started to commence... I commenced translating these characters and found that one of the rolls contained the writings of Abraham, another the writings of Joseph of Egypt, and so forth, a more full account of which will appear in its place as I proceed to examine or unfold them. Now this is right after Joseph had received these mummies. The interesting thing is that, there, that the papyrus uh, contained a great deal of writing, so much so that Joseph Smith has indicated that to translate all of it would be a larger uh, translation than the Bible itself. It was just, uh, he thought, a lot of information con uh, contained in there. In other words, it was going to be a great deal of information given to us. Now, um, Exactly how much there was, we wouldn't know, because we don't have all of that papyrus anymore. But when he tells us here, it was it contained the writings of Abraham and the writings of Joseph of Egypt, we know that we don't have the writings of Joseph of Egypt. And when Joseph says, I will unfold them and, and make them available to people as um, I'm able to do that, he did what he could, but by the time that he was assassinated, he was not able to complete um, doing this great and, uh, great and very interesting work. Nevertheless, he gave us what essentially was necessary for us to have, apparently, to increase understanding of temple ordinances and so forth. Because what you need to understand about the book of Abraham as we have it is that it is a temple book, and that the purpose in it is to begin to acquaint the children of Abraham, as he says in the first chapter, I wrote this for my posterity, with the ordinances that bring salvation. So Joseph says, I, I worked on these scrolls, and in July he said, I did research, and um, during this research, the principles of astronomy, as understood by Father Abraham and the ancients, were unfolded to our understanding. And when he talks about that, he tells us how the heavens are governed. And part of this is on the hypocephalus that comes with the, the papyrus and uh, is something that is buried with the eminent um, Egyptian, which is supposed to help see him into the eternal life and which contains a great deal of what we know. We know is a temple ceremonial material. And so Joseph says here, he sees the order that the stars are uh, in, arranged in, and we can read about that in the second chapter of the book of Abraham. And he talks about the great governing fixed star, which is the farthest that has ever been discovered by the, the fathers, and is Kolob. And uh, in Joseph Smith's writings, he indicates to us Kolob represents perhaps the sun and other uh, planets as, as they move into their positions are representative of various of the great spirits who administer the gospel or the prophets as Abraham was. So it's a dramatic kind of learning for the prophet Joseph Smith and for the saints as they begin to learn a little bit about this. And Joseph Smith tells us I, he saw that the Egyptians were taught their knowledge of astronomy by Abraham and Joseph, whose records testify that they got it from the Lord. Well, let's go back here for just a second. I um, have placed here facsimile 3, which is representative of Pharaoh receiving a patriarchal blessing from Abraham. Um, 
these things are teaching us priesthood kinds of concepts. And there, here we have uh, facsimile one. And this is uh, fascinating because how much Joseph Smith understood about this in 1835 in Kirtland, I wouldn't know. But by the time he had uh, worked on these things coming into Nauvoo, uh, he learned that this particular picture that you're looking at is uh, emblematic of the fact that Abraham was saved from um, the priests of uh, the various gods that his father worshipped who wanted to take his life, he was saved through uh, his use of temple ordinances, which is the reason that he has his hands extend extended in the, in the, the um, manner that he does, and his clothing represents temple clothing. So here we have facsimile 2, which probably contains um, the um, temple ordinances that we were what that we received in Nauvoo, and um, the prophet began to work with these things. He worked with them more and more as time went on, and he had a great understanding from them. He had some kind of initial understanding for, from them when they were in Kirtland. But here's probably the point that's most interesting to us. On October 3rd, 1835, Joseph had the Twelve come to his house and he exhibited the ancient records to the Twelve and gave explanations of the things that he saw on them. And his scribe was W. W. Phelps, the Lord's printer, who was now in Kirtland and uh, working with the brethren on printing there. And he was so inflamed with the truths that were given on the planetary system and man's eternal nature that he stayed up all night on the uh, 3rd of October, 1835, writing his song, If You Could Hide to Kolob. And um, in this particular song, he, him, he express, expresses these points. There's no end to virtue, to might, to wisdom, light, to union, to youth, to no end of priesthood, no end of truth, no end of glory, no end of love, no end of being, no death above, no end of to glory, there is no end to love, no end to being, no, there is no death above. So what he got out of that discussion with the prophet on that night in 1835, he felt just opened up his mind to eternity, and the saints began to feel that. Um, this is a, a photograph of a similar um, hypocephalus coming from a, a German um, museum that's gives, that is rather interesting as it has some variances from the Book of Abraham but many things that are the same. So when the Mormons got these mummies and began to exhibit them it was no longer this wonderful phenomena that, er, phenomena that everyone needed to come out and see. It was a, a subject of ridicule and in this particular Cleveland Whig article it's called Another Humbug, and, and uh, whoever wrote this claims that Joseph had said that one of the mummies was Abimelech, and uh, uh, King Abimelech, and his daughter. And uh, Joseph says here, uh, referring to this, I never said any, any such thing. And um, he was annoyed with the people, obviously, who were perpetuating this kind of thing. And as he writes in his journal, he says, these are the very same people who were claiming uh, in the name of Judaism that they were going to build their own New Jerusalem uh, nearby, somewhere here, and uh, took time out to ridicule the prophet for what he was doing. Okay, now we're going to go from there to where we're supposed to be today, which is the making of the covenant people uh, further expanded. Having looked at some of these things in the past, we're going to go a little bit forward and see what actually was taking place when the brethren now entered into a training period preparing them for the endowment that they were going to receive in this temple. And what this meant was they were going to participate in ordinances along the way or as soon as the temple got to a state wherein it could be utilized uh, in which the prophet took the leaders of the priesthood into uh, the temple in a school of the prophets type of meeting and uh, gave them various experiences that would prepare them and prepare their minds for the fact that they were going to receive an endowment and that they were going to become a different people. They weren't going to just be uh, the pioneers of 
the Kirtland era or the gentlemen of uh, the East, as they might have viewed themselves or as they struggled to be, they were of the House of Israel and they were going to begin to discover a connection with their forefathers who were a covenant people. They could read in the scriptures of a covenant people and even have a longing to be covenant people and to understand what it was, but their understanding of it was just like Nephi prophesied, almost nil, because of the covenants that had been removed, the, the doctrines and the covenants that had been removed from Holy Writ and from the practice of the, of the ancient people who left us a Christianity without these things in it. So one of the great things that we don't talk about in this class, we're not going to have time to talk about, is the Fishing River Expedition. And this is when Joseph took a, an army, so to speak, of 105 people, I guess, down to Missouri to redeem uh, Jackson County and the land from, that belonged to the saints who had been driven out in 1833. As they uh, went through that experience, and, they, and it is an important experience in church history, uh, they may have been discouraged with how that turned out at that point. But the Lord said to them, it's an expedient for in me that the first elders of my church who went down here and who went through this sacrifice and who are setting a pattern of what the redemption of Zion is going to be in the future, it's expedient in me that they should receive their endowment from on high in my house, which I have commanded to be built unto my name in the land of Kirtland. Now this is our governing scripture for this part of our discussion. The Lord said, before you are really going to be able to redeem Israel or redeem uh, Zion, you have to be endowed, and the church has to become more than a handful. It, it will become a great army. But in order to do, to redeem Israel, or Zion, or the Lord's people, you have to have a particular blessing given to you and an expansion of your abilities through the power of the Holy Ghost that will come by ordinance in this Kirtland Temple, preparatory as it may be. So these our considerations here are, what was the purpose in the remarkable events that occurred in the Kirtland Temple in January 1836, two months prior to its dedication? So what I'm saying to you here is we're going to center on some very remarkable experiences that occurred, particularly beginning January 21st, 1836, in the Kirtland Temple, even before it was finished. As soon as the walls were up, and as soon as there were substantial rooms within the temple, Joseph began to move people into the temple for meetings and for uh, the school of the prophets and other things that they had to accomplish there. So they were getting used to uh, meeting and working within the temple even before they had finished it. And some of these things that happened there were some of the most glorious things that have ever happened in this dispensation. What particular ordinance did the priesthood leaders receive after the temple was dedicated? Now, obviously, by this picture, you're going to take your guess that it would be the ordinance of the washing of feet, which is, of course, the correct answer. But this isn't the first time they participated in this, because we mentioned already that as soon as the Lord talked to them about that on December 27th, uh, in 1832, in what we now have as Section 88, they went out and performed this ordinance, and not just once. There have been periodic um, performances of this ordinance prior to the time that they get into the temple. When they get into the temple and they participate in this ordinance as a part of the endowment, it assumes even some new aspects. So here we have uh, Orson Pratt talking about this training, and he, and he is recognizing and he's talking later in um, Salt Lake City, or the Great Salt Lake Valley, about the early experiences that they had. And he's recognizing that they were preparatory and that they were trainings. And so he says here, and this is an interesting principle to understand, that when the temple was built in Kirtland, 
the Lord didn't see proper to reveal all the ordinances of the endowments such as we now understand, because in uh, the greater Salt Lake Valley, they had a full endowment. He revealed little by little, and he absolutely had to do that, because all of this knowledge that was rolling in uh, and being poured down upon these people was more almost than they could assimilate. I think I've mentioned to you before that it was almost more than Joseph could assimilate, and Joseph had a mind like nobody uh, since the Lord himself, and Joseph uh, was able to comprehend a great deal more than other, uh, others of the saints were, but there were uh, at least three times by the time we get into this temple endowment business here in Kirtland that he said, oh, I think I've finished all my work. And he hadn't, because as soon as he said that, the Lord poured forth on him some great manifestation of what the next thing was going to be. And so he also was learning and growing in spite of the fact that he was leaps and bounds beyond the rest of the members of the church. So Orson says to us here, in this little beautiful little temple, there weren't any rooms prepared for washings or no place for anointing, such as you understand in this temple. Now, some people in the class have not yet been to the temple, but they do understand uh, that washings would be symbolic, such as baptism is, for washing away sins or for cleansing people, and that anointings would be uh, being blessed with uh, oil that is consecrated and, and the individual being set apart as a consecrated servant of the Lord. And that's what's happening here in this early uh, situation, but they didn't have the uh, outlay of a temple as we have it now because this was preparatory. It was teaching. It was training. And he says that this period of the history of the church, uh, we didn't have all of these things and we didn't know the necessity of the washing such as we now receive. It is true that we washed our faces and our feet. Now you look at that and you can begin to think, well, that's a little different than what we do in the temple today. So something else was going on, or they had something in addition, or they had a learning experience that isn't necessary for us today. And so he said, Joseph, who was the president and presided over the church, as Christ did anciently, was commanded by the Lord to gird himself with a towel in the temple. And he said, and he is saying to us to wash our feet. And he says to his hearers in general conference in the greater Salt Lake Valley, what did he do this for? It was so that the first elder might witness to our Father and God that we were clean from the blood of that wicked generation that then lived. He says, we had already, as members of the Twelve, gone forth according to our best ability to publish the gospel for thousands of miles on this continent. And after we had done this, we were called in, and this washing of hands and feet was to testify to God that we were clean from the blood of this generation. Now, even the fact that they had gone out into um, the eastern states of the United States under Joseph Smith's direction at this particular time was a training and a preparation for the thing that would happen after the endowment was given. Because after the endowment was given, the Lord said to these people, you are now prepared to take the gospel to the rest of the earth, which in a manner in which you were not uh, able to do formerly before you had the Holy Ghost to assist you in that part of this mission. So they went out on a training. Now this is an interesting thing. All of the uh, missionary work that they had been doing was preparatory to a time when the Lord was going to expand that missionary work from the local area around them and even from the eastern states to go into all the world beginning with Canada and uh, into England and so forth. So as he he prepared them, it's very interesting to watch what they did because even in this year of 1835, prior to the dedication of the temple, when the twelve was first called and the seventy were first called, they went out, they were sent out on May 4th on these, the mission to the eastern states and they didn't just go uh, helter-skelter, 
they had a schedule. They sat down and figured out how they could cover that part of the United States and where they should be on this date and that date and the other. And we see this missionary training that Joseph Smith worked um, to provide for them before they went out and how precise and organized it was. And they went forth to declare the, the gospel and Orson says, we came back to be told that we were clean from the blood of this generation. And he said, when this happened, the holy anointing was placed upon the heads of the Lord's servants, but not the full de development of the endowments in the anointing. So even then, they didn't have the fullness of the lesser ordinances of the priest of the temple that we have today. They had a great deal that was preparing their minds for what would come in the future and, and with all ordinances. The Lord refined their understanding of it bit by bit as they worked with them. An example of that would be the restoration of baptism for the dead. As, as that was doctrine was restored, it people first went out and participated without keeping records and so forth. And as they went through these, the process, they began to learn more about it. So jo, uh, Orson says, these administrations in the Kirtland Temple were revealed little by little, corresponding with what I've already been saying, that the Lord does not give the fullness at once, but imparts to us according to his own will and pleasure. So Joseph Smith comes to uh, November 7th, and he calls all of these brethren, They're, they are to come home now, and uh, they have finished this tour in the mission fields that he gave them that went through the month of October. So he's planned carefully, and he says to them, I need you to come back into the temple. The walls are up sufficiently that you can come here, and we can begin to prepare for the solemn assembly in which you are going to uh, receive an endowment. And this is what he says to them on the 12th of November, 1835, as the, the 12 and the 70 gather in the temple, along with elders that they have called in from all the, uh, all the different missions that have gone forth in the church. And not only them, they've, the prophet has called into Kirtland the brethren who um, have administered the gospel in Zion. So if there was anybody left in Missouri to come home to participate in these ordinances, they came. So Joseph says, the endowment you are so anxious about, and oh, they would be anxious because he talked about it and talked about it and talked about it ever since they got there. In fact, it was referred to in New York before they left to come into Kirtland. He said, you've been anxious about this and you cannot even comprehend it. And even if the angel Gabriel came and explained it to the understanding of your dark minds, um, you wouldn't be able to assimilate it. So he says here, you have to strive in your hearts, be faithful, and when we meet in the solemn assembly, um, God will name the official members who will be partaking of these ordinances, and you will have to be clean every whit when you go into this assembly. So part of the things that were going to happen were to cleanse them in order to go to the solemn assembly and then to receive that, the endowment as it was going to be given. So then the prophet teaches them this principle. He says to them, the order of the house of God has been and will be, ever be the same even after Christ comes and after the termination of the thousand years it's going to be the same. And when we enter into the kingdom of God we'll enjoy it forever. In other words, we still will be participating in ordinances. So then he says to them we have to prepare the house. We have to have the solemn assembly and we have to have it organized precisely according to the order of the house of God. Now everything that happens in the house of God has to be absolutely orderly. And in it we must attend to the ordinance of the washing of feet. Now he's talking to the people who are, are the first laborers in the last kingdom. And they are going forth into the earth to begin the gleaning and bringing back uh, uh, the house of Israel together. And he says to them, 
you are the quote-unquote official members of the church. But what this means is uh, the, presiding, uh, the presiding elders. And I am <clears throat> sorry for that little pause there, which was my my fault. And we'll just continue forward here. When Joseph says this washing of feet was intended only for official members, it means uh, in our minds kind of a a matter of general authorities. Uh, the twelve particularly and in some instances the 70. And it is calculated to unite our hearts that we may be one in feeling and sentiment and that our faith may be so strong that Satan cannot overthrow us nor have any power over us here. So let's go a little bit forward and see what we begin to learn about this. Um, the saints put so much into the building of this temple in their poverty and uh, we are supposing that by the time they built this temple, there were 1,500 Latter-day Saints living here who put it together, possibly 2,000. Uh, the Lord had rewarded them for their sacrifice with more blessings and unusual vision, visions and unusual spiritual manifestations than in any other era in the history of the church. So these brethren who had come in from all over the church to participate saw heavenly messengers in at least 10 different meetings and at these gatherings different individuals testified that they had seen the Savior himself. Many experienced visions, some prophesied and some spoke in tongues. All preparatory and beginning to um, educate them in the value of what the Lord was about to do. So when the prophet gets these people here, and we're going to talk about this washing of feet, of feet and some of the beginning experiences, he calls them into the temple in January. <clears throat> they have a meeting on the 18th of January in which the First Presidency and the Brethren begin to outline everything that's going to happen at the temple dedication and they draw up the rules of the house, how you're going to behave when you go into the temple. And then on January 22nd, 21st of 1836, Joseph called in all the priesthood holders for uh, their Kirtland endowment. So he's calling some of these things that happened before the dedication of the, of the temple part of the endowment, at least uh, it's mentioned here in the history of the church that they're going to have an endowment prior to the endowment which occurs after the dedication. And the president of each quorum then anointed the head of his colleagues, each in turn beginning at the eldest. So what happens is they went into the upper story of the, of the temple and they begin this process of learning. And the presidents of each quorum are put in their order according to uh, who presides over whom, and each group takes its place, and the presidents of each quorum anoint the heads of, of his colleagues in that quorum from the oldest to the youngest so that they can be set apart and be ready for the things that are going to happen. Now, <clears throat> on the 21st of January, 1836, and I just fear this is probably where we're going to end today, but most, uh, some of the most remarkable things happen that have ever happened in this dispensation. This is prior to the dedication. It is preparatory. And as we look at what happened, we'll see how it's preparatory. And it occurred in this room that we're looking at here uh, on the third floor classroom for the School of the Prophets. And Oliver Cowdery went home and wrote in his diary for that day. And he went home very late. We washed our bodies with pure water before the Lord. Now Joseph makes a point of the water being pure also in his records. And uh, Oliver says, we did this so that we would be clean prior to the, to the moment that we were going to be anointed. So they came there cleansed. Um, 
in the early days of the church, and I don't know if that if that has any bearing on this particularly, they built a wash house next to the temple so that the brethren on their way in went in there and cleansed themselves so that they would be clean when they came in to the edifice itself. After we were washed, our bodies were perfumed with a sweet-smelling odorous wash. Those named in the first room were anointed with the same kind of oil and in the manner that were Moses and Aaron and those who stood before the Lord in ancient days and those in the other rooms with anointing oil prepared for them. This glorious scene is too great to be described in this book, which was his sketchbook where he kept his notes. Therefore, I only say that the heavens were open to many and great and marvelous things were shown. Now we'll go a little bit further and look at this account made of the same event by the prophet Joseph Smith. He says, in three, at about three o'clock in the afternoon, I dismissed the school. Well, he had been teaching the school in the printing building that was next to the temple. And the presidency retired to the attic story of the printing office where we attended the ordinance of washing our bodies in pure water and also performed perfumed our bodies and our heads in the name of the Lord. Now they did that in the printing office. And then he says, at candlelight, when it's beginning to get dark, I met with the presidency at the West Schoolroom in the temple. So now he goes over to that third floor to attend to the ordinance of anointing our heads with holy oil and also the councils of Kirtland and Zion the stake high councils of those two stakes, met in the two adjoining rooms and waited in prayer while we attended to the ordinance. I took the oil in my left hand, and his father is there, and he says, My father, being seated before me, the remainder of the presidency encircled him about, and we stretched our right hands toward heaven and blessed the oil and consecrated it in the name of Jesus Christ. And we then laid our hands upon our aged Father Smith, who was the patriarch to the church, and invoked the blessings of heaven. I then anointed his head with consecrated oil and sealed many blessings upon him. It would be interesting to know what he wrote. But then he says his father arose after having been blessed, and his father blessed the presidency. And then he says when it was my turn, this is extremely important to everything else that's going to happen. My father anointed my head and sealed upon me the blessings of Moses to lead Israel in the latter days, even as Moses led him in days of old, and also the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now in this blessing, which is like a patriarchal blessing in a sense, his father is telling Joseph, you're going to have the ability to lead Israel as Moses did Israel and call them out of the lands wherever they're scattered. And he gave him the blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When, or a, he promised him those blessings. So what that is going to show you is that Joseph's mind is now being prepared for the thing he doesn't uh, he hasn't comprehended yet, which will happen after the dedication of the temple when Moses and Elias and Elijah appear. So he's getting prepared for that, and his father gives him this blessing. All of the presidency then lay their hands on me and pronounced upon my head many prophecies and blessings, which I shall not notice at this time. Unfortunately, he didn't write them down, but as... Paul said, so say I, let us come to visions and revelations. In other words, let us be in this temple and set apart and anointed and in a position where the Holy Ghost can bless us with increased knowledge. Then Joseph says, this night was one of great revelation. Many of the other brethren saw glorious visions and received the ministration of angels. Some even saw the face of the Savior as the spirit of prophecy and revelation was poured out in mighty power. So uh, if we were to go back, and we, and we don't have time, but if you wanted to 
uh, take a look at the history of the church in volume two of uh, documentary history of the church where Joseph tells the things that occurred there you would read of one marvelous experience after another and it's uh, useful to do that where the Lord sh opened the heavens so to speak and in uh, in many of these instances intimated to them what the future of the church in the kingdom of God would be and that he was presiding over the work. Now here Joseph describes for us, and we're coming to the end of class, a most marvelous vision that he had in that room on the 21st of January 1836 in the upper room of the Kirtland Temple which is now in our Doctrine and Covenants as section 137. He says, I saw in vision Father Adam and Abraham and my father and my mother, my brother Alvin that has long since slept and marveled how it was that Alvin had obtained an inheritance in that kingdom, seeing that he had departed this life before being baptized for the remission of sins. All right, now you begin to see Joseph's mind expanding on the subject of salvation for the dead. He sees a vision in which his mother and father appear before him with Abraham and with Father Adam. Well, his mother and father are alive. They're living in Kirtland. They live in his house. We saw a picture of his house just a little bit ago. Father and mother live there. He sees his brother who died uh, at a very early age in um, Palmyra, New York, encouraging Joseph to be faithful to his work. And he sees his, his brother, who passed away before the gospel was, uh, or the kingdom of God had been organized, in that kingdom. Now he could have wondered prior to this how it would be that Alvin would ever be there, but he sees that he is there. And thus came the voice of the Lord unto me, saying, All who have died without a knowledge of this gospel, who would have received it if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. What a marvelous re uh, revelation Joseph is receiving here in this room. <clears throat> what he doesn't realize, or maybe he does realize, is that he has to have some keys given to him in order for these things to come to pass, and that he doesn't have them at this point. But the Lord says to him, Also, all that shall die henceforth without a knowledge of the gospel, who would have received it with all their hearts, shall be heirs of that kingdom. And then the Lord goes on to say, He will judge these people in the spirit world according to their works and according to the desires of their hearts. Uh, whether they would accept the gospel there uh, during a test of faith as here, uh, they would have that opportunity and would be able to receive the full blessing. And then Joseph says, I also beheld that all children who die before the years of accountability are saved in the celestial kingdom of heaven, which confirms something which uh, King Benjamin tells us in the book of Mosiah, that all children, little children, have eternal life. So Joseph Smith is seeing here some marvelous concepts that are the beginning of turning the whole world upside down on its head. So we are coming to the end of this discussion, um, leaving uh, our minds and thoughts at this particular revelation. And we'll keep it in mind, and we'll go through some more of the things that happened in the Kirtland Temple there, and then into uh, the remarkable circumstance when Moses, Elias, and Elijah come and bring the prophet the keys to perform the works that he has been prepared for up here in the upper room of the temple with the rest of his brethren. So I want to thank you for being with us in class today and I look forward to seeing you in our next discussion when we continue with this. Are there any questions? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. We'll see you next time.